After four years, nearly five years of negotiations, leaders announced an agreement on Christmas Eve. But the deal leaves some, if not many, major issues still up in the air. Joining us now to discuss kind of where we go from here, Robin Niblett, Chatham House Director. Robin, good morning. Uh, the British pound is trading at session lows versus the US dollar and against the euro. The market seems relatively unimpressed. What is your assessment? Well, I think the markets are just reflecting the reality of this deal. It was always going to be a bare bones, skinny deal. Um, it is remarkable, A, because of the size uh, of the economic relationship over $700 billion worth of, of bilateral trade. I mean, it is huge uh, in terms of, of the relationship, but it is a disintegration deal rather than integration deal. So what the two sides have done to each other, in a way, is make their economic relationship less effective more than more. So it's hard, really, to find positive news about it once you start stripping away the... So Robin, when we look uh, at, at what, go ahead. Sorry, you're just you're breaking up slightly. So let me jump in with a quick question. Um, when when we look at what happens next, is this just going to be a permanent Brexit negotiation that we are now going to find ourselves in? Everything uh, is going to continue to be negotiated on an ongoing basis. If one side wants to change the rules, the other side is going to have to negotiate that, and vice versa. Well, there's two areas where this is apparent straight away. One is in fisheries, where for the moment we have a kind of standstill arrangement for five and a half years. But thereafter, you're entering into annual negotiations of quotas. So that'll be a constant area of tension. More immediately, financial services, uh, where the EU has said, well, we're not quite ready to grant equivalents yet to UK financial regulation. So therefore, the bulk of financial services are not going to be able to be traded in an effective way between the EU and the US. So they're going to wait three months while they assess uh, uh, the standards, let's say, that the UK are applying. So you've got constant negotiation there. And then every time the EU increases areas of regulation on environmental standards, uh, on phytosanitary standards for farm products, for example, they're going to have to check whether the UK is still in conformity or not. And if they're not, and it's going to impose some type of disadvantage to EU producers, the EU could apply or, or disapply some of the favourable treatment for UK goods going into the EU. So you can see we're going to be in an endless negotiation and reassessment of each other's steps uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. Robin, as, as the politics gets taken out, though, and that discussion becomes more technocratic, do those deals become easier to do? Or do you think that this will remain a constant sort of high-energy political story, at least here in the UK? I think a lot depends on how well Britain is doing. <laughs> I know that's a weird thing to say, but if... If, if, let's say, the Johnson government feels that its levelling up strategy is working, if it starts to come out of the COVID crisis to the end of 2021, then in a way it can leave the EU negotiations to go into the more technical, bureaucratic uh, annual process. But the danger is that whenever things go wrong, you start to look for a scapegoat and an external enemy or problem. And historically, especially the Conservative Party, has always seen Brussels and the EU as part of the problem. So any negotiation that is getting sensitive, as we used to have even when we were members of the EU on budget negotiations, for example, could then flare up. The British press will be looking for those dastardly uh, Europeans over the channel as part of the excuse. So... Technically, we should be able to make this a more uh, a plain vanilla annual kind of process. But in reality, the politics will rear their head, rear its heads at awkward moments in the calendar. One of the objectives from the European Union side was to make it plain to any state that decided to follow the UK that life would be difficult, more difficult on the outside. Again, that must be an ongoing process. Again, is this going to make these negotiations more difficult and will increase the kind of political element within them? I don't think for the moment, um, because the 
assumption is going to be that given that we now just have a plain free trade area between the EU and the UK, it might be zero tariffs, it might be zero quotas, but you have new requirements for regulatory alignment that needs to be approved uh, on, a, on an almost product by product basis and constantly be reviewed. The assumption is the UK will no longer be quite as attractive as an offshore location for exporting into the EU market as it was prior to Brexit. So I think the EU feels that um, the, the, the impact, the negative impact, is likely to reveal itself over the next two to three years. The UK government, of course, hopes that they're going to be able to show that they'll be more dynamic outside the EU than they were before, but more attractive to foreign investment. I think until we start to see how those two stories play out in the next two or three years, both sides will keep their powder dry. One of the ways in which that might happen would be to see further trade deals being done by the UK around the world. The key one, obviously, the United States. What is your assessment of the likely timeline to get such a trade deal done? That's a very tough one. Um, we know that a deal with the UK is unlikely to be as much as a priority as it would have been for Donald Trump if he'd been elected. Uh, as president. So the Biden administration is not in a hurry to do this. Plus, you remember Boris Johnson, I think, for all of the words about it, is not going to be in a hurry to do it if it means having to make concessions on uh, U.S. agriculture in particular that would look like it was undercutting some of the high standards of animal welfare that the British public like to believe they're part of, and genetically modified organisms. Uh, all of these types of issues are highly toxic, politically relevant in the United Kingdom. So I think at the moment, the UK has got its hands full, A, trying to finish off the last few deals that it had as part of its EU membership. It then may want to look for some smaller deals that it can strike, Australia, for example, uh, some countries where it could almost test its teeth, including on agriculture, with a smaller country that has less leverage over it. And in a way, I think both sides can wait, afford to wait for a year or two. Britain is exhausted and its negotiators are, negotiate, are exhausted after doing this huge deal with the EU. Better to take a breather, let the Biden administration check itself in, show that the relationship is going to be OK, and then worry about this maybe in a year or two's time. That would be my guess. Yep, I think we're all exhausted by this whole process. A uh, well-deserved holiday today. Robin, thank you for joining us on it. Robin Niblett, Chatham House Director, we greatly appreciate your time.